Welcome back to another fireside chat given by members of the Unitarian Church's 150th Anniversary Committee. My name is Frank Edler, and I'm here to talk with you about Arthur Weatherly's second ministry from 1929 to 1942 at All Souls Unitarian Church. My earlier talk on Weatherly ended in 1919 after he returned to Lincoln from working in the South during World War I for the War Camp Community Service. I wanted to emphasize, I want to emphasize rather, that the church in November of 1918, at the end of the war, voted unanimously to bring Weatherly back to be their pastor for the year 1919. If there were any old wounds about his pacifism, they certainly didn't show up in this unanimous vote for his return. In addition, his experience of racism in North Carolina and Virginia made such an impression on him that when he returned to Lincoln in January of 1919, he refocused his ministry towards fighting racism and helping African Americans build their own community center. He was so committed to the community center that the African American newspaper, the Chicago Defender, mentioned, quote, great interest was being shown in Lincoln for the planning of a community center for African Americans. The Defender went on to say that, quote, the plot of ground has already been purchased and a drive is now on foot to raise the necessary funds for the building. Reverend A.L. Weatherly of the Unitarian Church is aiding very materially in this connection. Why then did Weatherly leave for Dayton, Ohio in October of 1919? It is unclear why he left. However, I do not think it was because church members still had old wounds regarding his pacifism. After short stays in Dayton and at Roslindale Uni uh, Unitarian Church outside Boston, Arthur and Clara in 1922 moved to the first Unitarian Church in Iowa City, Iowa, where they would stay until 1929. During this period when he was away from Lincoln, Weatherly did not stop attacking white supremacy and continued to advocate for social justice. In 1924, he wrote the first pamphlet uh, on race published by the National Federation of Religious Liberals. In the 19-page pamphlet entitled The Unity of the Race, he clearly saw that the theory of inferiority used as a basis for the justification of European imperialism in Africa, India, and other regions was the same one used to impose an internal imperialism in the United States, first in terms of slavery, then in terms of Jim Crow servitude, not to mention the near genocide of Native Americans. In addition, he demolished arguments claiming that African Americans were inferior because of their backwardness, brain size, color, or mental capacity. He addressed army mental tests used frequently to justify the inferiority of African Americans. He also gave talks on the race problem, such as the one he gave to the Unity Study Club in Moline, Illinois, on October 9th, 1924, entitled, quote, Delusions and Realities of the Race Problem. When Weatherly returned to Lincoln in March of 1929 to begin his second ministry at All Souls Unitarian Church, he found a changed Lincoln. After World War I, the city experienced an increase in both discrimination and segregation. Lincoln had its own chapter of the Ku Klux Klan with a clavern at 7th and Washington Streets. On September 11th, 1925, the, the Klan sponsored a parade down O Street. After the parade, the celebration continued on Capitol Beach in the light of three large burning crosses on rafts in the water. 
The African-American community, even before Weatherly returned, realized that their churches alone could not solve the problem of racial injustice and racial development. At a mass meeting of the congregants of three black churches in February of 1929 at the AME Quinn Chapel, it was agreed that a social organization was needed to supplement the work of the churches. Since the Lincoln chapter of the NAACP had declined in the late 1920s, the black community decided to form a Lincoln chapter of the National Urban League, formed in 1910, to promote social and economic justice for African Americans. In 1933, during the height of the Great Depression, unemployment rates among African Americans were at times four to six times higher than unemployment among whites. The saying among black workers that they were the last to be hired and first to be hired was especially true during the Depression when whites no longer had any scruples about taking jobs they previously felt were beneath them. In January of 1933, J.H. Kearns, Executive Secretary of the Omaha Urban League, who had conducted a survey of the black community in Lincoln, recommended the establishment of a Lincoln branch of the Urban League. And in March of the same year, a committee consisting of Millard T. Woods, African-American Executive Secretary of the League, Weatherly, President of the League's Board of Directors, and Trago T. McWilliams, African-American Vice President of the League, applied for membership <coughs> excuse me, to the Council of Social Agencies that coordinated and secured cooperation for welfare work. The Council accepted the League's membership. It marked the first time an African-American organization was accepted. The next year, the League became a member of the Community Chest. It was fortunate that Weatherly was also president of the Lincoln Social Service Club in 1933. During this time, the ripples of the Harlem Renaissance began to be felt across America, even in smaller towns like Lincoln. Elaine Locke, called the father of the Harlem Renaissance, published an anthology of works by African Americans in 1925 entitled The New Negro, an Interpretation. This work challenged the old hateful stereotypes of African Americans and reveled in vibrant new forms of creativity. Aaron Douglas, who had graduated from the School of Fine Arts at the University of Nebraska in 1922, went on to become one of the premier painters of the Harlem Renaissance. In 1933, Locke wrote a slim book entitled The Negro in America, published by the American Library Association for distribution in libraries across the country. He presented his work as a, quote, summary and outline reading course, unquote, on interracial adjustment. He declared that if the scales of racial discrimination and injustice would ever fall away from the eyes of white people, they would be able to see, quote, the story of African Americans as one of the impressive epics of human history. Indeed, as a, quote, great folk epic, I'm bringing up Locke in this regard because Weatherly, in 1934, may well have been inspired by Locke to write a play in the form of a pageant about the history of African Americans. Assisted by H. Alice Howell, who created the drama department at the University of Nebraska and directed the university players, he wrote a play entitled An Achievement Unique. In his booklet, Elaine Locke reviewed the history of blacks in America, quote, the main stages of this racial epic, unquote, and may have provided Weatherly the courage to write this play. Otherwise, likewise, Weatherly may well have agreed that Locke, one of the sa <clears throat> with Locke, that, quote, one of the safe intellectual approaches to the social problem is through a sound historical perspective, unquote. The play, 
performed on March 9 at the University Temple Theater depicted scenes from the history of African Americans from their capture into slavery in Africa to the present. Directed by Mrs. Blanche Johnson, an African American who directed the AME Quinn Chapel Choir, the play featured an all-black cast of 350 men, women, and children. What a creative way to bring black community together to learn about and experience its own history. Weatherly was president of the Lincoln Urban League for six years, from 1933 to 1938, and saw the Urban League's African American Community Center grow from a rented six-room house on 1946 S Street that opened in December of 1933 to the two-story house on 2001 U Street in 1935. The center was refurbished, this center was refurbished and expanded, but a faulty furnace caused a fire that gutted the building in January of 1940. Lincolnites rallied to build another bigger Urban League community center at 2030 T Street, uh, led by the fundraising efforts of Nathan Gold, president of Gold and Company Department Store and Weatherly. The new center was dedicated in April of 1942. In 1943, during the war, Millard T. Woods, who had been executive secretary of the Lincoln Urban League from its beginnings, left Lincoln to become the first African-American Red Cross field director for black troops in Northern Africa. Clyde W. Malone, was chosen to be his successor as executive secretary. Malone died in 1950, and a few years later in 1954, the community center disassociated itself from the National Urban League and was renamed the Malone Community Center. Weatherly retired in 1942, <clears throat> excuse me, and became pastor emeritus in the same month that the new Lincoln Urban League Community Center was dedicated. A gala celebration was put on at the All Souls Unitarian Church for the retirement of Arthur and Clara Weatherly on the evening of April 15, 1942. Many came to the dinner and program to celebrate their nearly 25 years of service to the community congregation and Lincoln community. On August 25th, 1942, the Lincoln Star published perhaps the last letter Arthur wrote to the, new, to the newspaper. Uh, he stated the following lines. To me, quote, to me the finest and best resolution of life is the surmounting of differences of opinion. When one can appreciate and respect another with whom he differs, even on very vital matters, he reveals the highest attainment of the human spirit. Upon retirement, Arthur and Clara moved to their summer residence in Hillsboro, New Hampshire. Arthur Weatherly died of a heart attack on Sunday morning uh, June 26, 1944, at the age of 77. Clara Jones Weatherly moved to Boston after Arthur's death to live with her sister-in-law, Marie, Mrs. Marie Jones, and died at the age of 85 in a hospital of a cerebral hemorrhage on May 23, 1950. Thank you.